Thank you, music team. Well, hello, everybody. I, I feel kind of like it's opening day at the ballpark. This is super exciting. Welcome to all of you who are here with us in person today. Welcome to those of you watching online whenever and wherever you might be as well. Uh, how cool that we are connected as a church family across time and space uh, to gather around the truth of God's word here together. So wonderful to be together. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here of our church, Divine Savior. It's my privilege to welcome you, to host you through our service today, and uh, to share a message from our gracious God, and to be able to sing along with you and worship our gracious God with you tonight. What a privilege and what a blessing to be together. We're going to begin by singing our opening song. The song is called By Faith. You're welcome to sing along as you'd like, or just to listen along as our music team plays and sings for you. Thank you, music team. We'll continue with our opening responsive reading. We'll go back and forth together. You can follow along with the words on the screen. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The one true triune God has placed his name on us. We come into his presence today to worship him. In his name, we are safe. As the scripture says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Therefore, as baptized children of God, let us run today into God's presence with a repentant heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness and keep us safe forevermore. Almighty God, we do not deserve your love. We are by nature sinful and spiritually dead. We have sinned against you by our thoughts, words, and actions. We have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We deserve your just judgment for our sins. But we flee instead for refuge to your boundless mercy. We trust your grace. We believe that the message of the gospel is true as you have promised. And so we run to your saving name, revealed through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear us as we silently confess the sins that especially trouble our hearts today. Dear friends, the Almighty God hears the cry of our hearts because he is our dear Heavenly Father. He has indeed had mercy on us for he has given his only Son to die for us and for Jesus' sake fully forgives all our sins. All who believe in Jesus as their Savior are children of God and heirs of heaven and God the Holy Spirit lives in them. God's word says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So take to heart this good news and trust in Jesus. In his saving name, you are safe forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit so that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment, knowing that only in Christ are we kept safe. Therefore, keep us also steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to turn our attention to God's words in the Bible. The first short reading today comes from Matthew chapter 28. Familiar words to Christians that Jesus spoke. If you remember last week, we wrapped up our series on the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, we saw this incredible scene, this prophecy of the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, and, and one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And that one like a son of man was Jesus, to whom was given all authority and a kingdom that would last forever and ever. It's an interesting connection to note that right before Jesus ascends into heaven, and he's going to give to his disciples their, their mission, the same mission we have today. Jesus comes to them and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Just as Jesus' favorite uh, expression uh, to, to, to apply to himself was son of man, so also here we have a hint of Jesus helping to connect the dots for us, who he really is, our, our Savior God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords who now sends out his church into the world to share the good news of what he's done 
for all people. Here are the words. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is God's word. And our second Bible reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. This congregation that Paul was privileged by God to start, people that were close to his heart, people that he was celebrating, that, that he had a partnership with, a special partnership. And that's kind of a cool way to think about what it is to belong to a church together. We're, we're not just family together in Christ, but we're also partners in the mission of sharing his love, of sharing the hope that we have, of sharing the good news about Jesus. So Paul writes these words that equally apply to us, and, and what a privilege to be part of God's church. Here, here's what he says. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And, and maybe, maybe you felt yourself that way the last three weeks, being disconnected from your church family. I mean, a blessing to be able to, to worship together online, but, but there's a longing, isn't there, to see each other, to sing together, to worship together, to encourage each other. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is God's word. We're going to sing our hymn of the day that, that reminds us what a privilege it is to be united around the truth of God's word together. i 
Well, once again, welcome to all of you who are here with me today in person. And those of you watching online, again, wherever and whenever you might be, what a blessing that we can be together today around God's word. Let's go to our God in prayer. Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you for revealing to us the truth of who you are in your word, that you are a God who is real and a God who cares. A God who cares about each and every one of us. We thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world to be our Savior, to reveal and embody the truth of God's love. Help us today to grow in our faith that we might also overflow with love for each other and for the people of our world. Bless us today by the power of your, your Spirit that all our fears and worries would be chased away and in their place a settled peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we're actually going to be studying an entire book of the Bible. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not going to be any longer than you might expect. It's actually just going to be 13 short verses. You see, we're going to be studying a, a little letter kind of tucked away in the, the back of the New Testament written by the Apostle John, one of Jesus' dearest friends. We're going to be studying 3 John today, right? John wrote three letters. 1 John, that's kind of his longest one. 2 John, that's a short one. 3 John, that's where we're going to be today. Well, what's neat about it is you're going to see it's, it's a little surprising because it's a, it's a very personal letter. It's written to an individual. And, and we're going to see how, how wonderful it is today when Christians walk together in the truth and then work together for the truth, the truth about Jesus, the Savior of the world. So let's get into it. I'm just going to read the first verse to start off with, just kind of a, an introductory verse. Here's how it starts out. The elder... <laughs> To my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Okay, so the elder. Who is this guy, the elder? This, this is John here. John, who's writing this letter. We're talking about the last living apostle of Jesus Christ here. Towards the end of his life, probably as an old man now. He's called the elder, both probably because he's an old man, but also because he's highly esteemed as the last living apostle of Jesus Christ. And so at this time in his life, he's serving as an overseer of churches near Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. That, that's where John was, and kind of being a bishop or an overseer of all these churches there in Asia Minor. Today, that's Turkey. And he's, he's writing this letter to this guy named Gaius. And we don't know exactly who this Gaius was, but it seems likely that he was a member of one of the churches close to where John was serving. John was familiar with his church and, and knew him there. So just kind of think for yourself for a moment how thrilling, how thrilling it would be if you're Gaius to get a letter from the last living apostle of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? To hear words that you know, in John's sight, you're not just some ordinary Gaius. You know, you're, you're, you're somebody who's a member of, of the church, somebody who's considered a dear friend in Christ. Even though it's likely that with a, a Roman name, Gaius had a very different background than John, a very different ethnicity than John, that Gaius was probably from a Gentile background. Who knows how he grew up? But John considers him a dear friend in Christ. Okay? So Gaius is getting this personal letter from the Apostle John, which if you think about John being the, the last living disciple or, or apostle of Jesus, th th we're talking about a guy who was there with Jesus, right? Who, who saw him and heard him preach and teach, who witnessed the miracles firsthand. Here in John was somebody who, who was Jesus' close friend. How about that? A fishing buddy. <laughs> Of Jesus. Here in the Apostle John was somebody who was there to see the crucifixion 
of Jesus, somebody to whom was entrusted the care of Jesus' own mother, Mary, right? Somebody in John who three days after the crucifixion went, went running to the empty tomb, remember that, and put his head in there and probably his eyes got big as saucers as he realized the tomb was empty and he didn't know what to do. And then he saw Jesus alive and he got to hang out with Jesus over, over 40 days. And then he saw Jesus ascend into heaven. He was there to hear Jesus say, go and make disciples. And 10 days after that, he was there when the Holy Spirit was, was poured out on Pentecost just as Jesus promised, okay, so John, and you think, oh man, Gaius, how cool is this to like go to your mailbox one day, you know, open it up, and here's a letter, handwritten by the Apostle John with your name on it. All right, here's what John has to say to his friend. Verse 2, he writes, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well? Uh, you, you, I mean, you can kind of all relate to that right now, huh? A lot of prayers going out for health, general well-being. And, and that's a good thing. That's a, that's a God-pleasing kind of prayer. What, what John is praying for his friend is actually that, that he's saying, Gaius, I'm praying for you that your physical health would be just as strong as your spiritual health. That's pretty cool, huh? If somebody could think so highly of your faith that they would say, may your physical health be as strong as your faith right now. Verse 3, he goes on to say, it, it gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So, so John had apparently, sounds like, sent some people to go visit Gaius and the members of his church to see how things were going. And, and the good news is, when they came back and reported to John, they, they gave him a glowing report about Gaius and about the faith of the people there at the church. I, that's kind of a cool thing, you know, from time to time we get, we get visitors who, who are coming in here and I hope more and more and who knows who is also able to watch with us online and connect from a distance. And I, I think that'd be kind of a cool thing if people came to our church out of the blue and they went home and they said, you know, I've never experienced people who love like that. And that, that pastor's message was, was spot on. That'd be kind of cool. But the most, the most impressive. Here's what John says, again, gave him the most joy. Verse 4. What did he say? He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Gaius was walking in the truth. Friends, how about you? You know, that phrase, walking in, it's kind of, it's one of those you know, biblical expressions that you find in, in different places in the Bible, right? It's kind of a neat Bible way of referring to, to one's entire way of life, right? To walk in something, it's your, it's your way of life. It implies that to be a Christian isn't just to, to believe differently from what other people believe out there in the world, but it's actually to live your life in a distinctly different way than other people out there in the world. And we're going to see for Gaius that, that you know, his faith wasn't just a matter of talk. And, and it wasn't just that he believed in, in Jesus in some sort of abstract or merely doctrinal way, if you know what I mean, but, but that his faith actually impacted his, his attitudes. It, it changed his, his thinking processes. It, it, it affected how he lived his life and how he treated other people and how he would spend his money and his time to help and support others. It, it, it showed evidence in his, in his priorities and how he would love and serve other people. It changed him. And it was evident in the way he represented well the name of Jesus to others. Gaius was walking in the truth. So friends, how, how about you? I mean, like, everybody's talking right now. 
right? People are walking. So this is, this is for you. This is for you to think this through. Are you walking in the truth? Or have you perhaps found yourself walking in the paths more of your own opinions that you've started to elevate to the same level as God's truth? Have you found yourself maybe elevating your own earthly politics, your own opinions about what's going on in the world right now to the same level as God's truth, what we need to know about Jesus and how to live our lives as Christians to show love to other people? Has any of the ways that you've expressed yourself in the last week caused any other fellow brother or sister in Christ to stumble in their faith or caused anybody else to just push back from drawing closer to Jesus or to consider ever belonging to part of his church. Think about it for yourself. I can't know what's going on. I know what's going on in my own heart. And I just think if, if John the Apostle were to write me a letter right now, Inspired by the Holy Spirit. What, what would he say? What would he say to you? One more time, verse 4. John, John says, I, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. I mean, as a, as, as a, as a father, as a pastor, I, I, can't, I can't think of anything that gives me more joy either. Those of you who are parents or, or teachers, you, you understand this too, right? Like I think about my own, my own kids and how, how wonderful it is to see them grow up and to see their faith, you know, start to shine out as they go through different situations. I love to be here in chapel, you know, with the, with the little kids and to hear them sing their Jesus songs. I even enjoyed correcting seventh grade catechism projects this year at the end of the year and seeing their art displays and how they explained, you know, the things that we've learned this year in class and what an impact it's made on their life and, and how they want to apply that one day when, even when they're parents and they have kids. It's pretty cool stuff to be able to say, I have no greater joy. The truth is, I have no greater joy than knowing that my kids are going to be with me one day in heaven because they believe in Jesus. And that remains a top priority in my daily prayers. It will be until the day that Jesus takes me home to heaven. John said, I, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, why does he say that, right? Well, he says that because of, of what the church is. The church is a family. A family of faith, a family of believers in Jesus. And it's likely that Gaius was somebody who came to faith in Jesus because of his friendship with or through the ministry of the Apostle John. You think there's joy in that? Imagine if today there was somebody, if, if for every one of you who is here, one other person that you became a friend, a friend with, you know, that resulted in them coming to know Jesus. You think that would change the energy level in a church? Do you think that would raise the bar on how important worship is and what it means to be together? If people who were unbelievers and had no hope or no peace or were, were full of pride or were crushed under despair, if they came to know the hope and the joy and the peace of Jesus because you became their friend and you took the time to listen to them, they were family, forever family. And John's saying, I, I want you all to know that joy. The joy of being a spiritual father or mother to somebody in a sense. So John goes on, verse 5. Here's what he says. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. 
We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. So here we, we, we learn something really beautiful about the Christian church, right? That the people who walk together in the truth will naturally also want to work together for the truth, the truth about Jesus. So uh, maybe to kind of help us understand what, what was going on here, uh, it, it might help for me to just real briefly explain what was going on in 2 John, the other letter that he wrote. You see, in 2 John, he, John was writing a letter to a church because what was happening is some, some traveling teachers were coming to this one church, and they, they were bringing some, some goofy ideas about Jesus. They were bringing some false teachings about Jesus there, and so John had to write them a letter and basically tell them, don't, don't welcome those people. All right? If they're not bringing the teaching about Jesus, like we, that's important. The truth is important. Don't. Don't support that false teaching ministry. Don't write a check and support a ministry or a cause that, that is going to you know, defame the truth about Jesus. So that helps us understand maybe now what's going on here in Third John, where maybe it was John himself who sent out these, these teachers to kind of go check in and encourage and, and help these, these believers over here in these other churches. And Gaius was rightly welcoming these other believers into his church family, into his home. It sounds like he was maybe putting them up for the night, you know, giving them some food. And now, now John is encouraging him to kind of send them also on, on their way, whether that was giving them a little money for the road, providing some food to take along, perhaps writing some letters of recommendation they could take to the next church, that that kind of a thing. Because if you think about it, without the support, without the support of people like Gaius, would these faithful teachers sent by the Apostle John, would they have been able to carry out the work of sharing the truth about Jesus with people? Not very likely. I don't know if they had jobs and businesses that they left to go do this or not, but it doesn't sound like they have a, a full-time stream of income coming alongside of them. It wasn't like they could expect the Roman government to subsidize their missionary trip. In fact, they probably faced persecution and pressure wherever they went for the name, the name of Jesus, as they went along. And so in that sense, they seem to be entirely dependent on gifts of love from God's people wherever they would go. And yet, it sounds like they, they, knew they could count on it. Because they were working together for the truth. They were united in their beliefs based on the Bible and in their mission to share the gospel with more people so that others would know the truth about Jesus, too. You know, that's one of the really cool things about the unity that we have in Christ. Christian unity doesn't mean that people have to dress the same, look the same, listen to the same music, like the same sports teams, drive the same cars, have the same political opinions, come from the same place. In fact, God is glorified when people from different backgrounds come together, regardless of how they look, to gather around the truth of his word with one heart, one mind, one mission to share the gospel with more people. I think that's one of the really cool things that makes our ministry here in Doral a special one too. In this multicultural, international kind of place, and with this ministry that God has built here, this partnership that we have between our church and the a school that gathers an audience for the gospel of, of students and families for, for the church, for us to reach out and love to and to share Jesus with. And because God has blessed that so much, we've been able to expand also into other campuses and other places, even into another state in Texas where we're going to be opening up another Divine Savior Academy this fall and a church to partner with it. And a school just there 
the Divine Savior School to reach community of people with special needs right here? That's super amazing stuff, if you think about it. Like-minded believers who are working together for the truth. Could we do it on our own? In a, in a broader sense, too, you know, we're, we're connected to a national church body that supplies us with teachers and pastors who come in here with, with the same mission mindset. And that's a, that's a rare, rare treasure in our world today. When, when believers both walk together in the truth and work together for the truth, God is honored and gospel ministry happens. But 3 John also helps us to see, by way of a warning, what happens when believers don't. So let's go on. Here's what John writes in verse 9. He says, I wrote to the church, so it sounds like there's maybe another letter that we don't have here yet. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, so he calls this guy out, Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. I mean, yikes here, right? This guy, Diotrephes, sounds like a real piece of work, doesn't he? So how does, how does John describe him? He, he says about Diotrephes, he, he loved to be first. Right? He, he was not somebody who saw leadership as primarily serving others in love. He saw leadership as a way to wield power. And as crazy as it sounds, he, he, he looked at like, excommunication as, as just another weapon to wield, to put people out of the church. That's what he was doing. And the criterion that he was using, whether to keep you in the church or to put you out of the church, it sounds like was whether or not you listened to the Apostle John. <laughs> like, it takes some pretty arrogant kind of thinking to say, if you're with John, you're out of the church. <laughs> it takes some pretty arrogant kind of thinking to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all I can to destroy the reputation of the last living apostle of Jesus Christ <laughs> and to put out of the church anybody who doesn't look to me and my authority. I suppose that's an extreme example that finds its way into the, into the New Testament here. But, you know, in, in a church, there, there is gospel ministry that God wants to accomplish, right? But sometimes also, just like out there in the world, there is gossip ministry. And the Bible tells us to choose carefully, really, which kind of ministry we're going to support. Gossip is talk that destroys, right? It, it harms instead of heals. It, it assumes the very worst instead of the best. Gossip tends to puff up the person who is, who is speaking it at the expense of tearing down the person who is being gossiped about, right? And when that happens, gospel ministry is hindered. Anytime people in a church are, are spreading malicious nonsense, like John says, it's going to dishonor God and hinder the work that God wants to carry out. And that's why John says he's, he's not going to let that happen. He's going he's to show up. He's going he's to discipline diatrophies, and he's, he's not going to put up with that. I guess I'm kind of glad, though, too, that you know, this doesn't happen all that often where one individual gets called out like this in the inspired word of God. And, and real quickly, John kind of moves on as if to say, I'm not going to let one bully get in the way of the gospel ministry that Jesus wants to carry out. And so he gives us this advice, which you have, if you have ears to hear is really good for everybody right now. Here's what John says, verse 11. And again, he says, dear friend, 
do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. All right, so if you think of that, that's just really, that's really great advice, isn't it? In a way, he's saying, don't, don't, get, don't get dragged down, don't get sucked in by people like Diotrephes. Don't, don't emulate their actions. Don't do what they do. Instead, when you see evil, the way to move things forward is to imitate what is good. That's what another guy, Demetrius, did. So we heard about Diotrephes. Well, the good news is there's a guy named Demetrius. And here's what John says about him. In verse 12, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. All right, so Diotrephes wanted to wield power. Demetrius was content to prove himself by being a servant leader and pursuing what is good. Diotrephes was, I guess, driven by his own personal ambition and Demetrius, on the other hand, he, you know, was just driven by love for Christ. <laughs> Diotrephes had an agenda. <laughs> he wanted to be first. Demetrius, the only agenda he was after, sounds like, was, was God's. To be able to help other people know that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So I guess you could say, walking in the truth naturally leads believers to want to work together for the truth. To be here today with you is just, it's a joyful thing for me. Because I know that's the case with all of you. Like, we're in a special place. And in a, in a special time in the history of our world where what we need is Jesus. Jesus. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm super excited to be here in this place at this time because I think God has so much more and so much potential yet for us to do here together in his name. And of course, Satan is just really hard at work in our world right now. I mean, it's just like Jesus said in the end times. Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. I think it's getting pretty cold out there right now. Sounds like a strange thing to say in Miami, doesn't it? But it's getting pretty cold out there in our world. Because of sin, there's racism, there's violence, there's selfishness and corruption and greed. And that doesn't stop when people just walk in the door of a church. Right? Satan's going to use everything he can to inflame our own sinful natures to get us to gossip about other people, to spread malicious nonsense about people. He's got an agenda that he's trying to carry out in this world to divide and to destroy. But if we keep loving and serving each other, if we keep walking together in the truth, if we keep worshiping together and praying together and working together for the truth, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to continue to change lives with the good news about Jesus. He's going to continue to give the one thing that, there, that no other thing in the world can give. And that is true peace. The true peace that comes, that comes about through only the, the reconciliation that Jesus carried out when he came into this world as one of us, our, our human brother. That while we were still sinners, each and every one of us, enemies of God, Christ died for us to restore our relationship with God. And Jesus didn't just come into the world. He didn't just come and say, hey, I, I love you. But he came and he lived as one of us. He embodied the truth. He walked in our skin. And so offered up himself as a sacrifice to pay for all our sins. 
and to win forgiveness for us that we might be with God forever, to be reconciled to him. And so John finally closes here with a word of peace. Here's how he wraps it up. Verse 13, he says, I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. You know, if people could do that more, huh? Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. You know, I don't, I don't know how long it had been since, since John was with these people, actually. You know, was it, was it weeks, months, years? What I do know is it's been 11 weeks since we've been able to gather together as a church family. And I, I suspect it's going to be a few more weeks and perhaps a few more months before we'll be able to gather again with everybody when everybody's ready and able to come back. And that's okay. I, I praise God that we can stay connected online. But there's something special about being together, isn't there? There's something special about being able to connect face to face. So I send you my greetings wherever you might be. And I say, peace to you. Keep on imitating what is good. Keep on walking together in the truth. And keep on working for the truth about Jesus, the Savior that our world needs. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we're going to confess together the words of the Nicene Creed, our hope in our triune God. We'll put the words on the screen to follow along. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you, everyone. At this time, I'm going to make the announcement specifically for the people who are watching online. Uh, this is a great time if you haven't had a chance yet to connect with us in person. If you can click the connect button and, and fill out a digital connect card, we'd love to be able to stay in touch with you and you can ask whatever questions that uh, you might have about um, our church. Uh, there's also an opportunity to submit a digital prayer request there if you're watching on the, the live uh, platform or down in the uh, description on, on our YouTube channel. You can find links to do that there too. Uh, and there's also a link or a, a give button to uh, be able to give an offering online as well if God uh, moves you to do that with joy. So at this time, our music team is just going to play some music during this time. Uh, it's a good time to just kind of meditate on the word that you heard and uh, to do any of those things online that I was just talking about. Thank you. Oh, when 
God has shown Lead us in a prayer, and then I'll invite you to join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, hear the prayers of your people and grant to us all things according to your word and promise. In the beginning, Father, your word spoke all things into being, and from nothing you made all that is. Help us to see the imprint of your love in the goodness of creation and to exercise responsible care of all that you have entrusted to us. Forgive our apathy, indifference, and abuse of the good things you've given us. Especially, Father, help us see that in every human is someone who is your special creation, bearing the dignity and value that comes from being originally made in your own image. Lord, forgive us all for our sins of commission and omission. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Throughout the ages, Father, despite human rebellion, your spirit has filled this sin-stained world with hope. And you continue to call us all to repentance and faith in the Savior you've provided for us who lived and died for each of us. Help us to hear the voice of your word to cherish the truth and to respond in faith to our Savior, Jesus. Let our lives, Lord, reflect the hope and the love that comes from knowing you. Help us avoid getting caught up in what is evil and, and to imitate what is good. Keep us and our children always walking in the truth and working together for the truth to your glory. We praise you for the consistent blessings you showered on us here, and we look to you for wisdom and using them well into the future. Supply our divine Savior ministry, all that you know we need, and help us to be faithful in representing your name to others. In these tumultuous times, we call upon you, loving Father, to heal our land and to mend and reconcile and promote peace and prosperity for all people in the ways that you know best. Lord, we perhaps don't know what is needed right now, but you do. Open our eyes and ears and and hearts 
to the concerns of others that we would all just first listen. We perhaps don't have the words to say, but you know what's weighing on the hearts of your people wherever they are, and you, you interpret our sighs as prayers that are pleasing in your sight. And so we don't always know what to do or say, but our eyes are on you. Grant wisdom to all who lead, that they would not be like Diotrephes, but more like Demetrius. Leaders who would seek to serve and represent you and not any sinful or merely human agenda. Calm the unrest in our cities and lift up the just cause of those who are oppressed. Comfort those who grieve and mourn. Console those who are disturbed and protect those who are in any danger, whether physically, materially, emotionally, or spiritually. In our world, Lord, deliver us from the threats of pandemic and tyranny and preserve the nations in peace. Bless all who defend us in the armed forces. Aid us in emergency and medical fields and inform us with honest news. Hinder those who oppress any peoples with mistruth, violence, or fear. In the hour of trial and in the moment of trouble, you are there, Father. Hear us as we cry to you for the sake of the sick, the the troubled in mind, the wounded in heart, and those who grieve. Deliver them from affliction and sustain them in hope each and every day. All these things and whatever else you know we need, we we pray that you grant us, dear Father, for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Don't move too quickly, I guess. That's what I'm learning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Well, you're welcome to stand and sing along if you'd like with our last song. It's also kind of a a prayer for our world today.
Thank you, music team. Have a seat, everyone. I haven't been able to look out and see people in so long. Usually when we've been wrapping up a service and then we know that the live stream cuts off, we just go, woohoo! We kind of celebrate and then realize there's nobody here to celebrate with. So <laughs> it's good to be together today, everyone, with all of you. Uh, God's blessings to you. Just a couple quick announcements. So right after the service, if you could, if you're willing and able to help us, we're going to stack up all the chairs and just put them over in the corner. And then we've got another that we'd, we'd like to bring out and set up more or less in the same way for the people who are coming in tomorrow. If you could help us do that, that would be, that would be great. Uh, next week, we'll be starting a, a new series. It's going to be really, really good. Can We Talk, it's called. Uh, we're going to be studying through the book of Psalms. Uh, just some of the, the, the people crying out to God or, or, or like imagining a conversation back and forth with God. So Pastor Caleb is going to be leading that uh, because uh, my family, we're going to be taking a little time off. So we'll see you, uh, God willing, in a couple of weeks. And Pastor Caleb and Pastor Steve will, will be here to lead worship. And uh, if you need anything, you can reach out to them. All right, well, again, God's blessings to all of you this new week of his amazing grace. Uh, keep your eyes open for the, the next opportunity to, uh, to sign up, to register, to uh, worship together in person, or to continue worshiping with us online. See you soon. This world.